and Catherine McBanois act as a middleman between see, them. You see hit that act right there where he's like, oh God, I'm shaking my head. I can't believe this. Look at this. Look at this guy over here. What an actor. From the actual shooters what by having actor. Catherine McBanois. Donna Adelson has been arrested. She was arrested last night. She's 73 years old. She had a one-way ticket to Vietnam. She was ready to go with her husband, Harvey, and they were at the airport. But they were intercepted by law enforcement, FBI. And if you guys are wondering who Donna Adelson is, she is the mother of Wendy Adelson. Wendy Adelson and Dan Markell, they were married. They have two beautiful, well, they had two beautiful children. Had or have, I don't know, have. They had two beautiful children together. And they went through a very acrimonious divorce where Wendy at some point wanted to relocate and move closer to her family. Her family have a, they had like a very successful or seemingly successful dental practice and dad was working there. Mom's working there. Um, the brother, Charlie Adelson was also working there as well as a dentist. And if you guys think Charlie Adelson, if that name rings a bell, he was actually convicted about a week ago for the murder of Dan Markell. Now, the story is, is that Wendy Adelson wanted to move to be closer to her family, didn't get her way. The family were also pissed as well. So it seems like the entire family were kind of in on this like hire for murder hitman plot thing. So the story is that this guy right here hired, well, this guy right here was um, in Cahokes, I guess, with Cahokes, Cahoots. <laughs> Cahoots, sorry. It's, it's a little early for me today, I guess. Uh, was in cahoots with his ex-girlfriend, Catherine Men Menobagua. I can't pronounce that, but Catherine, will call her Katie. And apparently she hired her baby daddy to murder Dan Markell. And he also got his close friend in on it too. It's like, it's really wild at like how many people were possibly involved in this whole thing. So we have this guy right here. He gets with his ex-girlfriend she hires her baby daddy baby daddy brings in his close friend so they can so they can murder dan markell uh dan markell was found shot to death um in back in 2014 in his car sitting in his garage the neighbor came by and i think dan markell was also on the phone with a friend as well and noticed that there was someone coming up on the you know the driveway and so right now we have this woman right here this is donald adelson this is the mother of the man who was convicted last week it seems like she might have been trying to like escape to Vietnam because if you look up, Vietnam um, does not have a um, extradition or sorry, the U.S. does not have an extradition treaty with Vietnam. So if a convict were to run to Vietnam and the U.S., you know, wants to hit up Vietnam and say, hey, you know, can you like send over this person, please? Because, you know, they're wanted for murder. It's going to be very hard to do so. So it seems like they made the move to, you know, prematurely. Um, arrest her because they want to make sure she doesn't escape to Vietnam. What boggles me is that this is a family that has money. I was wondering why the hell did they buy a one-way ticket? Why not buy a round trip ticket just to make it look like, hey, I'm going to go to Vietnam, but I'm going to come back at some point. Why buy a one-way ticket? Because it just looks really shady. Maybe they purchased it thinking that they weren't going to be caught, but yeah, this is the craziest story. Yeah, so how I heard about the story was actually a while back. Uh, this was a couple years back. And I remember being livid about it because I heard about the two hitmen getting in trouble. I heard about the girlfriend getting in trouble, but it seems like this rich family, it seems like they were untouchable. No one was getting in trouble. No one was being charged. So now we have finally one members of the family getting charged, uh, Charlie Adelson, and then Donna has been arrested. Now, we don't really know what the involvement is with Harvey Adelson. I know there was a recording. Um, it was like an undercover recording that was between um, this guy and his dad. But we don't really know the extent of whether or not the dad was like super involved. But we'll see, you know, because he hasn't been arrested yet. But the other question is, what about Donna, Donna Adelson? Donna Adelson, who was the wife of the man who was murdered. And there's been a lot of really suspicious activities with Donald Adelson. Apparently, she drove by his house that day when he was murdered. And she claims that like she couldn't see what was going on. But they were like, no, when you pulled up over there, you should have been able to see that there was like police car around. And like if your husband or your ex-husband lives there, you should have been concerned. You know, something should have went by your mind. And then also it was like, well, why were you there at that location? Apparently, she said that she was on her way to the liquor store. But there was another liquor store that was closer to her and the liquor store that she was heading to. She took like 
a very long way to get there. Not a straightforward way. She like went like the long winded way. And she was like, oh yeah, this is the way that I normally take because I'm really bad with directions, I guess. But there's just a lot of really shady stuff with Donna Edelson as well. And people are waiting to see if she's going to be next, possibly. I'm sorry, is it? Yeah, not Donna Adelson, Wendy Adelson. Sorry, I mix up Donna and Wendy. Wendy is the daughter who's married to Dan Markell. Donna Adelson is the mom. She's in her 70s and she's been arrested. So this case is just, it's freaking wild. I had to make sure I get the names right. Thank you so much. When she was interviewed by the police, this was seemingly a five hour long interview. And I guess in the transcripts, within the first five pages, she drops something and says, oh, you know, my brother did jokingly say that he would, you know, hire Hitman, but it was cheaper to buy me a TV after my divorce. It's like, why would you mention that? Why would you even say that? So it seems like she was already kind of like narking on her family members. But anyways, you know, it's, it's actually pretty crazy because you have a whole family of professionals. Um, Wendy went to law school. She was serving as a law clerk. And I think at some point she was also a law professor as well. We have this man over here, her brother, who was a dentist. They have a very seemingly successful dental practice. Mom's also there. The dad's also there as well. So you have a whole family of like people who went to school. They're educated. But like, how do you have so many morons all cluttered together? Like, I don't know. This case is pretty wild. A question I ask often these days. Yeah, it's like, how do you have so many dum-dums? It's all like, I don't know. How did no one decide like, hey, you know, this is a bad idea. I'm going to tell the police on you. You had so many strings of people that were involved. And the crazy thing is, let's talk about his, his ex-girlfriend, Katie, who was the one that hired the two hitman. Why did she get her baby daddy involved? Does she not care about her kids whatsoever? If something were to happen to, you know, the father of their children and the mom as well, it's like, you're just like, you're, you're just dooming your kids. Now your kids don't have a dad, don't have a mom because they're both in jail. And then same thing for the Adelsons as well. Like, are you guys also not thinking about the two young children? At the time of the murders, the children were three and four years old. So it's just wild because they lost their dad at a very young age. They're losing, you know, some crucial members of the family members. They're losing uncle, maybe grandma. We don't know if something's going to happen to mom. But it's like people just aren't thinking about the children. You know, they're fighting over the children. They claim they care about the children. But do you even care about the children? No, it doesn't seem like it. It seems like you guys are all just really freaking selfish and you're egotistical and you just want things to go your way. I want to watch um, the opening statement by the state. And this was in the Charlie Adelson trial that happened a couple weeks ago. And again, remember, he was convicted last week. His sentencing is going to happen in, I think, like the first two weeks of December of December 12th. So we'll have the sentencing for Charlie Adelson. Now, just a little thing. Um, one of the hitmen got so one of the hitmen pled guilty. And because of that, um, he had like a reduced sentence or something. Um, second hitman was prison for got a life imprisonment. Same thing for Katie, life imprisonment as well. And so do you guys think he's also get life imprisonment as well? That's what I'm thinking. I think that's where it's heading. Um, I'd be very interested to see what's going to happen with Donna next. But yeah, I want to watch the opening statements uh, from the state. And I think um, she'll recap a lot of the stuff. And I think I haven't watched it yet. So I haven't watched it yet. This would be like a first time thing before I start the opening statement. Um, I do want to mention we are working on I'm working on this video right now. There's this case that I've been very, 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 very interested in. I don't know if you guys follow the community tabs on my YouTube channel. But um, there's this case that I'm working on. I'm editing the video right now. I'm just adding the effects. And I did have a poll up to see if people would be interested if a video was longer than like 20 minutes or 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. And so because this move, this video was already like over an hour. And I was like, oh, man, I don't know if this is like too long. If people are going to like this, like I, I wasn't trying to like stretch it or anything, but I felt like there's just so much information that I wanted to just include in there. And also, I'm a very talkative person. So sometimes you know, I'm like, blah, 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 blah. I'm like running my mouth sometimes. But um, yeah, there's a video that I have working uh, that's coming out soon. And yeah, I hope you guys watch it because this case has been it's been wild. It's been bothering the crap out of me. It is an unsolved case, though. But um, the remains were found uh, roughly two months ago, and I hope they are able to move forward with the case even more. But yeah, I do appreciate your guys' feedback, though. Um, again, I appreciate your guys' support. Thank you so much. You know, for those who are like part of the membership, I appreciate that. Thank you for you guys who always do like the super chats or like the stickers or if you're on Twitch as well, if you're subscribed and stuff like that, I do appreciate it. And just having you guys like in the chat, just chatting, like that's what I appreciate the most. Um, thank you so much for just being here or having me in the background. Cause you know, when I was, when I listen to stuff too, I usually like 
kind of like do chores or like, you know, I'm doing laundry, taking a shower, blah, 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 working on stuff. And then I usually have like my true crime stuff in the background. Uh, this is a state opening statement in Florida versus Charlie Adelson. And yeah, let's see what she has to say. I just feel like the entire family is just a family full of liars. Okay. Cause like from the stuff that I've seen so far, a lot of it just does not make sense. Like for example, his defense right here, Charlie Adelson said that, well, you know, my ex-girlfriend, she did hire two hitmen to kill my ex-brother-in-law, but I wasn't involved. I'm, I'm actually a victim. I'm a victim of all of this. You know, as a fact, like they try, they try to, they try to blackmail me. They try to extort me. You know, I'm, I'm a victim just like everyone else, just like Dan Markell. And you know, what's weird about it though, is that when the family members were essentially being blackmailed into like, you know, Hey, you know, you better pay up because I killed, I killed this person for you. And I'm just going to say that you hired me. And so when they were being blackmailed, they didn't go to the authorities at all, even though, and you know, maybe it was like, Oh, maybe there was fear of their life. They didn't want to, you know, be murdered themselves, but the two men were arrested and Katie was also arrested as well. So it's like, well, where's the fear of life then? If they're both sitting in jail, it's not like they're going to come after you. So even though they were arrested, why didn't you tell the authorities about the blackmailing and all that stuff? So the story just does not make sense. And this is crazy because we were in 2023. And again, the murder happened in 2014. It's been nine years. So get these people. The reason that we're here today is because the defendant in this case, Charlie Adelson, hired a hitman to kill his former brother-in-law, Dan Markell. This murder was set into motion because back in 2014, the defendant's family, the Adelson family, had a big problem. And that big problem was Dan Markell. And the solution to that problem was this defendant. This defendant was the solution to that problem because he had a girlfriend with connections mm. to the type of people who were willing and capable of pointing a gun at a complete stranger and pulling the trigger. The victim in this case... I did hear about that. Yeah, Katie was tried twice. Yep, the first time was a hung jury. Thank goodness he convicted her a second time and she got life. Look at his face. You know, when I was listening to his testimony, he was looking pretty darn smug. But when I watched the verdict, that verdict, everything just came crashing down and he was just like, you could just tell his whole world was just destroyed at that point. Gun at a complete stranger and pulling the trigger. The victim in this case was known as Danny to his friends and family. He uh, was a loving father to two little boys. He was a highly respected professor at Florida State College of Law. And tragically, on July 18th of 2014, Dan Markell was shot twice in the head in broad daylight in the driveway of his home in the Benton Hills neighborhood here in Tallahassee. And he had just dropped off his three and four year old that day in preschool. And then he went to the gym afterwards. But like, these are just young kids. I, I can't believe they, I can't believe they, they did this. I can't believe, a, no, no one was like, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this. This is a bad idea. Hi, Oahu, how are you doing today? The last day of Dan Markell's life that day began like any other of uh, his mornings that summer. He woke up, he drove his two little boys to preschool and dropped them off. And then he drove over to the gym to work out. After finishing his workout, he returned home. He pulled in his driveway, opened his garage, but little did he know that throughout his just normal routine that morning, he was being followed. He was being followed by two hired hitmen who traveled all the way from, Tala from Miami to Tallahassee for the sole purpose of murdering him. And just like something out of a horror movie, he pulls into his driveway and the car that unknown to him pulls in right behind him. Moments later, Dan Martell's neighbor heard a gunshot. He looked out the window and he saw a light colored Toyota Prius backing quickly out of Dan Markell's driveway and then speeding away. The neighbor waited for a couple minutes to see if maybe Dan Markell came out of his house or backed out of his driveway too. And when nothing happened, this neighbor got that funny feeling that maybe something could be wrong here. So he walked over and what he found was a gruesome scene. He walked in the garage and saw that the driver's side window of Dan Markell's car was shattered. He saw Dan- mm -hmm. One way ticket to Vietnam. What? crazy to me is this family you know they they got monies why didn't they just buy a round ticket just to make it look like they're gonna come back because buying a one-way ticket it don't look good and you know it'd be kind of interesting to see their search history results they're so short-sighted yeah it's just it's just so dumb all this is just so silly walked in the garage and saw that the driver's side window of dan markell's car was shattered he saw dan markell was still behind the wheel uh with 
He was alive, but he was oh, moaning. My God. He was unresponsive, and he was terribly injured. The neighbor then goes and calls 911. Law enforcement arrives, and they find Dan Markell unresponsive with um, gunshot wounds to his head. He was then taken to the hospital where he survived for uh, several hours before he was actually pronounced dead. Imagine just doing your daily tasks like every other day, then this happens. Yeah. And from what I've heard, apparently the two children, um, they have not visited the gravesite of their dad yet. Crazy. Dan Markell was 41 years old. And the, his little boys that were deprived of their father that day were just three and four years old. Law enforcement immediately began to investigate to figure out who shot Dan Markell. And the evidence they find sets them down two separate paths. One path is that they had to track down that light-colored Prius that the neighbor saw fleeing from the crime scene and identify who was inside that Prius. And the other path relates to Dan Markell's personal life. They looked to see who, if anybody, in Dan Markell's personal life would hate Dan Markell enough to kill him. And after years of tireless investigation by law enforcement. Years, years. Uh... The ex-wife is questioned about that. Apparently the children. Yeah, I heard about that as well. Um, I think like the the grandparents on the father's side, they live in Canada, right? I think they said like they have not been able to see their grandchildren. Um, ex-wife is questioned about that. Yeah, I remember hearing about that. Both of these two paths led directly to this defendant. So he's shaking his head. Let's talk about the path involving Dan Markell's personal life. First. Shaking his head. In looking at who might have a motive to kill Dan Markell, law enforcement learned that Markell was entangled in a very nasty divorce mm. with his ex-wife, who is the defendant's sister. Her name is Wendy Adelson. A review of their divorce case file revealed that Wendy Adelson asked the court to allow her to move back to Miami, where she was from, with the kids in order to be near her parents, whose names are Harvey and Donna Adelson, and her brother, the defendant. Dan Mark so what, that's like Tallahassee's, right? Where um, Dan was initially shot? Google. That's a pretty far drive. Tala How do you spell Tallahassee? Tallahassee? Tallahassee to Miami. Was it like six hour drive? Oh my God. So it seems like they were living in Tallahassee. And at some point, Wendy wanted to move her and her kids to Miami, closer to her parents. But that would mean that Dan would be like a seven hour drive away from his kids, roughly around then. And so she tried to, you know, ask the judge who was overseeing the divorce if she could move. And the judge denied that. And then within a year later, within a year later, what happens? Dan Markell is found dead. And not only that, apparently at some point, the mother, Donna Adelson, she offered Dan Markell a million dollars to allow Wendy and the kids to move to Miami. It's like, can you imagine? Like, I don't know. It's like a K-drama thing where it's like, oh, I'm going to pay you off. Okay. You know what? Your kids, I'm going to give you a million dollars for them. It's like, I don't know. That's just like so, that's just so scummy. That's just so shady. That's just so gross. Markell was... Harvey and Donna Adelson and her brother, the defendant. Dan Markell was adamantly opposed to his children being relocated to Miami. He was a law professor here in Tallahassee. This is where he lived. This is where his kids have been raised. He wanted his kids to live here with him. Yeah, a million dollars. And apparently, I think um, Charlie Adelson said that he was willing to pay like a third of it. Um, and like he had like cash laying around. I know the whole like the whole thing where it's like, oh, Kat Katie was the one who, you know, did her own thing, hired a hitman, did this all herself. And then later on, they tried blackmailing me and I'm the victim of all this. Just really doesn't make sense because more and more things are, comes out and it's just like, eh, you know, it just doesn't really explain your story. Like, for example, um, why wouldn't the hitman, if they're just trying to get money out of you, why murder Dan Markell? Why not just go after you directly? You know, why not just put a gun to your head and just take your money. Like, why not just do that? Why would they hire someone and then try to blackmail? Like, I don't know, this is just like a whole mess thing. Or why not just like rob your house? Because apparently he said he had like a lot of cash laying around and Katie knew this because, you know, they were dating obviously. And that like Katie made the mistake of like mouthing about like, you know, how Dan Markell has like all this money and how he's having this issue with the brother-in-law thing, blah, 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 blah. Like, it just doesn't make sense. It would just be like, okay, well, if these guys wanted your money, they would just go after you. Why hire some, you know, why murder someone? Why not just go after you? And He's like, well, 
you're just going to have to ask them. It's like, yeah, it's because you know that it doesn't make sense. Charlie's so, story is so stupid. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I've been getting bits and pieces there. I haven't watched the whole thing yet, but, you know, we got to watch together at some point. And for this custody dispute, the judge ended up ruling in Dan Martell's favor. So Wendy Adelson was not permitted to move to Miami with the children. Mm. Unless, of course, something happened to Dan Martell. Mm -hmm. A review of Wendy Adelson's emails revealed that her mother, Donna Adelson, hated Dan Martell and was desperate to find a way for Wendy and her children, who were Donna Adelson's grandchildren, to be able to move to Miami. Oh, can I jump in a little bit too? Apparently, um, the mom, Donna Adelson, like picked Dan Markell. Like, this is the man that you're going to date. <laughs> I'm like, how involved was this family in like their daughter's affairs? Like, can you imagine like having your mom pick like, okay, you're going to date this person. I don't know if it was like on an app or something, but apparently the mom was like involved with who Wendy was going to date. I don't I just remember hearing about that and I thought it was crazy and I thought it was wild. Imagine not caring about your grandkids that much. If you did take the one million, the kids will grow up knowing that the dad left for money. Exactly, because obviously the parents are, sorry, obviously the grandparents, they're going to poison the children's mind when they're older. Like, hey, did you know, by the way, your dad was offered a million dollars and he like ditched you guys for a million dollars. Obviously they're going to use it against him, right? Yeah, that would be so weird. Oh, Leela. They want to move from Tallahassee. Now they're going to end up in the same place in prison. Leela, thank you so much for the five. I appreciate your support. And again, guys, I appreciate you guys just being here and chatting and everything. But yeah, thank you so much for the five, Leela. Um, I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Wait until you see the emails that Wendy was sending or that Donna was sending to Wendy. They were wild. Oh, my goodness. Oh, we'll see. I haven't seen them yet. I haven't seen them yet. Thank you, Leela. I appreciate it. Donna Adelson suggests in these emails that y'all will hear about several ways that Wendy Adelson could threaten or bully Dan Martell into submission. Oh my God. Into getting what uh, she wanted him to do. Donna Adelson even suggested offering Dan Martell a $1 million bribe mm -hmm. to allow the relocation. And even said that this defendant, Charlie Adelson, would pay a third of that million dollar bribe to Dan Martell to make that happen. And I do think that when um, there was a bit that I saw where when Charlie Adelson was being cross-examined, he was just like, oh, yeah, that one million dollar that we offered to Dan Markell. Well, we actually offered him to come down, too, because we know that he would, you know, he would not have a job. And we offered him a million dollars just so he can just get started with his life, making it seem like they also wanted Dan Markell to relocate down south as well so he can come down. And they're just they're just helping Dan Markell with this a million dollar. So it's just kind of interesting to see how this family will take something and then twist it and be like, oh, no, like we, that wasn't a that wasn't a bribery. That was me offering him money so he can come down and be with his kids, too. Like mm, lies and deceit makes no sense. I'm glad the jury, you know, they were smart enough to see right through all of this. The evidence in this case will show that Donna Adelson's closest confidant was her son, the defendant. She and the defendant talked multiple times a day, every day. He was the person with whom she would constantly vent and complain to about Wendy's situation. The defendant was also the person that Donna Adelson relied on to solve her problems. And this was a big, big problem for Donna Adelson. And she made it the defendant's problem to solve. So the divorce between Wendy Adelson and Dan Markell was final about a year before the actual murder. But that was not the end of that case. Litigation was ongoing, to say the least. Each side would continue litigating? to routinely file violations of the custody agreement, violations of the settlement agreement, and that continued right up until Dan Martell's death in July of 2014. This was a highly emotionally charged situation between. And then also, like, did they not think that the Mark, like, that the Adelsons would be the obvious people? who had something against Dan Markell. Like if Dan Markell wasn't involved in any like shady stuff or had like enemies and stuff like that. Like it just seems so obvious that people would point their fingers at Donna and then possibly her family members. <laughs> who were they, who were they thinking? I'm really were. I'm really like wondering what the heck were they thinking? This was a highly emotionally charged situation between them leading up to his death. Um, however, there was no physical violence that Wendy Adelson needed to be rescued from or anything like that. But make no mistake, this was a very messy custody dispute. Yeah, see, that's what I was thinking initially. Um, before, like, this is like back when I first heard about this, I was like, oh, maybe the family got involved because they were so worried about Wendy 
you know, maybe her husband was like abusive or something. Maybe it was abusive towards her, the kids. Like maybe they were just desperate. No, 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 no. None of that. There are no records of any of that. These people are just, they're just crazy. Okay, they're, they're freaking crazy. Yeah, I heard about that too. Um, you said the dad filed a restraining order against her grandma, I think, but never got passed because he died. I heard that Dan Markell um, did want the did want the judge to rule on like I think like having maybe like the grandmother having like limited contact with the children because she was like bad mouthing him or something like that. Um, I, I heard it briefly, I think, um, when I was listening to I think Law on Crime. But yeah, I like heard something about that as well. Shortly before the murder, in fact, Dan Markell, the, the victim, filed with the court um, and basically asked the court, he alleged that Donna Adelson was disparaging him to oh, his children okay, by saying bad year. things about him. And he asked the court to enter an order preventing Donna Adelson from having unsupervised contact with her grandchildren. This motion was still pending in court when Dan Markell was killed. Oh, okay. This is exactly what we're talking about. Um, also, can you imagine... Can you imagine being a grandma who is bad mouthing their father when the kids are three to four years old? I I get it if they're like maybe teenagers, if they're, you know, older adults. I mean, even though the teenagers, you, sh you really shouldn't. But they're three to four years old. I wonder what Dan Markell knew slash thought what the grandmother was saying to his kids. Like, what could you say to a three and four year old? Wow, just dragging the kids into this. The murder of Dan Markell ensured that an adverse ruling on his motion would never be a problem for the Adelsons. And just about 48 hours after the shooting, Wendy Adelson and the little boys relocated to Miami. Shortly thereafter, moved into a home within walking distance of the Adelsons' Miami home. Within a year of Dan Markell's murder. Oh my God, they, she really is stupid. She only waited two days. Two days. I wonder if before... Oh my God. I wonder if, do you guys know if before um, Dan Markell was shot, do you know if Wendy was already making plans to move? Like if she was already like getting ready and anticipating this? Dado told the kids that she hated their father, that he was stupid, and that he takes her sunshines away. Vom. Donna's pure evil. Right after. That's. I wonder, um, for investigators, I wonder, um, yeah, what's, what was the process for all of this? Like, I know it took investigators a long time for them to really like, you know, start getting some people, um, start figuring out who was involved, but that's crazy, man. I, I guess they, they just had a hard time maybe tying, like maybe the Adelson family to this. Wendy Adelson legally changed Dan Markell's son's last name from Markell to Adelson. Wow. Just like that. Their Sorry, father blasted him. Within a year of Dan Markell's murder, Wendy Adelson legally changed Dan Markell's son's Hi, last Corgi, name Corgi's from Markell. Balloon, Corgi's balloon, how are you doing? <laughs> hello, hello. Dude, I, this, Wendy is unbelievable. Of Dan Markell's murder, Wendy Adelson legally changed Dan Markell's son's last name from Markell to Adelson. And just like that, their father was just effectively erased from mm -hmm. their lives at three and four. And the Adelson's family, their big problem had been solved. Yeah, because by now the kids, they're like teens. Um, like, what, what are they, like 12, 13, 14 years old? I wonder what the kids think now. Oh, man. Um, could be brainwashed by mom. You saw it? Okay, there, I feel like maybe there's something else that I wanted to chat with you about then. But hi, Momo, how are you doing today? You'll hear during this trial that the Adelsons are a very tight-knit family. The defendant and his parents, Harvey and Donna Adelson, they actually even all work together or worked together at the Adelson Institute, which was their family's dental practice. At the Adelson Institute, the defendant and Harvey Adelson were dentists and Donna Adelson managed the office. After Dan Markell was killed on July 18, 2014, law enforcement interviewed Wendy Adelson. And Wendy Adelson acknowledged that her family had a motive to kill Dan Markell mm. or to want him dead. She admitted that her brother, the defendant, had even said that he looked into hiring a hitman to kill Dan Markell as a divorce present to her, but he decided to buy her a TV instead because it was cheap. Apparently, um, he like went around telling people this. Like he would jokingly say that like, oh yeah, you know, like I bought my sister a TV because it's cheaper than hiring a hitman. Um, 
And I think Wendy, I think she repeated this as well, but I wonder if Wendy was already planning to like, you know, just in case if people start looking at me, I'm going to just throw my family under the bus. I wonder if she was already getting ready to just throw her brother under the bus, maybe her, you know, mom as well. What a loser. Why would they say that? Mm -mm -mm. You heard Wendy got a lawyer that specialized in a law that is going to protect her and she's not going to get charged. Wendy's next. What? Hire hitman. Maybe just a TV. Hey, love and live. I remember hearing that his parents weren't allowed to see their grandsons after. Oh, the grandparents after he was killed. Yeah, you're talking about the grandparents, right? Um, sorry, the, the grandparents on the father's side. Yeah, apparently they have not been able to have contact with their grandkids. And coincidentally, or not, that TV that this defendant bought his sister as a divorce gift instead, instead of hiring a hitman would be Wendy Adelson's alibi for the morning of the murder when the defendant, when the victim was killed by a hitman. So this path of looking into Dan Martell's life to see who would have a motive to want him dead leads law enforcement to the Adelsons, including yeah. this defendant, a no man who told his family that he'd looked into hiring a hitman to kill Dan Markell. The defense asked yesterday in jury selection, you know, who's talked trash or heard somebody talk trash about an in-law, which is not a rare concept. A lot of people don't like their in-laws. But the difference here is that... What in chat if you don't like your in-laws or if you don't get along with them? <laughs> Two in chat if you get along with your in-laws. The defendant's comment, stop being just a little bit of trash talk when Dan Martell was actually killed by a hitman. While the police are trying to investigate, you know, who in Dan Martell's personal life may have a motive to kill him, they're simultaneously going down that second path I described to y'all, which was tracking down the vehicle that the neighbor saw fleeing the crime scene. When law enforcement retraced Dan Martell's steps the morning of the murder, they uncovered some chilling surveillance video of a Prius fitting the description of the one seen by the neighbor, following Dan Martell into the Premier Gym parking lot, waiting for an hour while he was inside, and then following him home from Premier Gym back to his neighborhood. They got this, these surveillance images from city buses, from Premier, from everywhere they possibly could. And these surveillance images, coupled with a massive amount of phone data and SunPass records gathered in this case, help police to eventually track down the exact car used in this crime. Oh, is SunPass kind of like the equivalent of like, like I don't know, like an easy pass or something where it's like you use this like little thing um, it's like a little device that you like pay for and then like you get to go through the tolls and stuff like that. Is that what a sun pass is in Florida? I'm just assuming. <laughs> One, zero, two, two. Oh, for those of you guys who are twos, you guys are lucky. I prefer my in-laws over my own. So yeah, da, 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 da. What's the option where you're like, where you like your in-laws more than your own parents? <laughs> okay, zero if you have no in-laws yet. One, if you don't like your in-laws or they don't like you. Two, if you get along. Three, if you like your in-laws more than your own parents. How about that? <laughs> right, like a toll pass type of thing, right? Your in-laws hate me. Why do they hate you? They want to erase any connections to their own father. Yeah, it's just like, it's just so shady. Mm. Got some zero, zero, two, three, one, one. I don't know. It's like, I don't know. Parents, in-laws, whatever. Although there is like another set of in-laws that are okay. Um, they're okay. Like Dennis is, Dennis is like real dad. Um, and like his stepmom is okay. And his other, and his stepdad's okay too. But they're manageable too. <laughs> oh, cause you're not Chinese. Listen, I'm there with you on that one. I'm there with you. Dennis is Chinese. Their family's Chinese. Um, I'm not Chinese and well, I'm a little bit Chinese, but I do not adhere to stupid Chinese family custom stuff. Um, no, where it's like, where it's like the daughter-in-law has to take the abuse of, you know, the in-laws and all that stuff. No, fuck that. I am not taking anyone's shit. Okay. I'm in my thirties now. No way. Boo of them started here. It's not good. But police still had to figure out who was in the Prius and why did they kill Dan Martell? As part of this really painstaking review, that law enforcement did of, of all of these records. And when I say painstaking, finding this Prius and finding this, these, all of this evidence and all of these records was not an easy task. And it took longer than your average investigation. It was very difficult to do. They combed through yeah, why did it take tons so of phone records and even did um, what's called a tower dump, which is where law enforcement collected a list 
of all of the cell phone numbers that communicated with the cell tower that serviced different spots in Tallahassee that Dan Markell was at that morning, including Premier Jim, when the suspect's Prius were there. Because they thought if the person in the Prius was using their phone at the time, then their number will be somewhere in this tower dump. They combed. Oh, wow. I wonder if um, the Prius, if it was rented or if it was actually like the hitman's like actual personal vehicle. But I also wonder, maybe at some point it took so long is because they probably maybe lost track of the Prius and didn't know, could it maybe see, maybe see like the license plate of the Prius or something like that? Or I don't know. I guess I want, I'm wondering like why it took so long, but I guess she's like kind of explaining it right now. If the person in the Prius was using their phone at the time, then their number will be somewhere in this tower dump. They combed through all of that data and they found a number with a Miami area code belonging to a man named Sigfredo Garcia. Mm, one of the hitmen. Law enforcement examined all of Garcia's call logs and saw that he was in frequent contact with another number that was also present at Premier Gym that morning. And that yes. number belonged to a man named Luis Rivera. The other hitman. Luis Rivera is a lifelong friend of Sigfredo Garcia and is also from Miami. Police then looked at all of Garcia and Rivera's phone records which showed that their phones left Miami about two or two days before this murder on July 16th of 2014. The You're telling me these men did not put their phone on airplane mode or didn't leave their phones at the house? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I don't know what the prosecutor's name is. Um, I do not know. Oh wait, prosecutor Sarah Dugan. All right, this is Sarah Dugan. Hi, Sarah. All right, Sarah, continue on. I'm sorry I'm interrupting so much, Sarah. Miami about two or two days before this murder on July 16th of 2014. The phones came to Tallahassee and on the day of the murder, July 18th, they followed Markel to Premier Gym. The phone data is consistent with both men turning off their phones just minutes before the murder <laughs> and leaving their phones off until about an hour or so after the murder when they're well on their way back towards Miami. Oh, okay. So they know that you should turn off your phone or whatever, but why even bring your phone to begin with? Just leave your phone in Miami and just, you know, just leave it, just leave it at home or something. They brought their phones, but they're like, you know what? Let's just turn off our phone like an hour, you know, we're not going to get caught. Oh my goodness, these people. And then a bank's ATM camera caught both Garcia and Rivera in that light colored Prius once they arrived back in the Miami area when they stopped at an ATM. Mm. So, Throwing that money, that deposit. The navigation, Prius has navigation, doesn't it? <laughs> Police figured out the identity, and this should appear on the screens in front of you, the identity of the two men responsible for following and killing Dan Markell. Two men right here. Luis Rivera, his nickname is Tato, and Sigfredo Garcia, his nickname is Tudo. Tato and Tudo. But they continued to look for evidence of why this, why two seemingly random men came all the way to Tallahassee to- Wait, were they burner phones, Mike? Were they? I mean, because they don't need their phones. They could just left their phone in Miami. Wait, were they burner phones? I don't know. She didn't mention that. Kill a man, Dan Markell, that they'd never met. You know, what or who is the connection between these killers and the victim? Well, phone records reveal that one of Sigfredo Garcia's most frequent contacts was a woman named Catherine Magdanoa. Her nickname is Katie. Katie. Garcia and Catherine McDaniel have a long history of an on-again, off-again relationship over the course of many years, and they actually share two kids in common. Mm. And lo and behold, when looking at the phone records, Catherine McDaniel is also one of the most frequent contacts Charlie of this defendant, Charlie Adelson. Law enforcement learned that at the time of Dan Markell's murder, this defendant was dating Catherine McDaniel. She was his girlfriend at the time. So Dan Markell was a problem that this defendant needed to solve for his family. Oh, they all had burner phones. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Prius has navigation, but you have to pay for the monthly subscription. But using the phone GPS, though, uh, the car is free. You know, maybe you just got to do like what we did back in the old day. Back in the old days, we had those giant map books, you know, pull over on the side of the road, open that book and figure out where you are. <laughs> I don't know. No digital footprints. No digital footprints. The defendant was looking to hire a hitman to kill Dan Markell. Hey Tyrone. Dan Markell ends up being killed by a hitman. And who ended up being the hitman? It was someone with a close relationship to this defendant's girlfriend. The hitman was the father of his girlfriend's children. Mm. So you can see how both leads in this case, followed by investigators. Both of them charted paths to this defendant. Not only did looking into the motive lead law enforcement to the defendant because he wanted to hire someone to kill, to, uh, kill Dan Markell, but looking into the car, fleeing the scene, also led law enforcement to the defendant through his girlfriend at the time. So 
exactly print instructions map quest actually no i don't know that you might be tracked for that too because you know your search internet history and all that into the car fleeing the scene also led law enforcement to the defendant through his girlfriend at the time so two different investigations arriving at the same conclusion you got this sarah you got this <clears throat> law enforcement also tried to follow the money in this case and that was a third way that the evidence in this case points to this defendant Law enforcement reviewed bank records, employment records, DHSMV records of all of the suspects and saw that in the months after the homicide, Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera, and Catherine McManawa all acquired some big ticket items. Wow. What are Rivera they? and Garcia both bought motorcycles and cars. Catherine McManawa got a breast augmentation surgery <laughs> and later received a black Lexus sedan whose previous owner was Harvey Adelson. Okay, what is that movie that we watch? Um, sorry, I'm saying we. There's a movie that I watch, you know, like, uh, oh, what's, I'm trying to think, what is it turn? Italian mobsters. The boss got mad of his underlings for buying gaudy things because the boss wants to make sure everything is low key. It's like, hey, when you get money coming in, don't be buying your wife's no fur jacket, new car, new house, none of that shit, okay? You are to live the same life that you were living before. Do not do anything stupid. Did these people... Did they, did they not watch, like, you know, these, like, old school, like, crime, like, boss movies and stuff like that? American Gangster. Oh, no, I think the scene I'm thinking of is American Gangster, though, with uh, Denzel. There's a scene with Denzel where he, like, goes off on his, like, underlings for, like, buying their wives, like, fur coats and all that stuff. And he, like, tells them all to return it, get rid of the presents and all that. Oh, my God, these people. They're just not very smart. Catherine McMahon was bank records were analyzed. And there was no check ever written or matching cash withdrawal for the car or the breast augmentation, which was <laughs> paid for in cash. Oh God. Bank record also reviewed, bank records uh, also showed rather that Catherine Ray Banois' account had a huge spike in cash deposits right around the time of the murder. She deposited more money into her account in the five weeks following the murder than in the entire previous year before the murder. This was during a time when there was no record of her being employed anywhere. Also, about two months after the murder, the defendant added Catherine McBanois to the payroll at the Adelson Institute. And she began receiving regular checks from their business account every two weeks for two years. Wait, was she still working at the Dental Institute? After the murder. And this was despite the fact that she did not work at the Adelson Institute. Oh, she did not work at all. So, no. the money How was talking. describe this? What, what were the suspects saying? That's what law enforcement wanted to know. So... As they're examining the phone records in this case, they see a distinct pattern surrounding important events and dates in this case. The phone calls, and they can't see the content, they can't hear the content of these calls in these phone records, but they see that the calls are occurring. And the I thought, no, I thought she did work there. I thought, <gasps> I thought she did briefly work there. Um, and that's how they met her and Charlie. Oh, she never worked there. She, I thought she did. Hold on a second. So the money was talking. But what were the suspects saying? That's what law enforcement wanted to know. So, no. as they're examining the phone records <laughs> in this case, they see a distinct pattern surrounding important events and dates in this case. The phone calls, and they can't, see the content. they can't hear the content of these calls in these phone records, but they see that the calls are occurring. And the phone calls always went from Donna Adelson to the defendant, mm. then from the defendant to Catherine McBanois, mm. then from Catherine McBanois to Sigfredo Garcia, oh, no. and back the other way. Kind of like train cars, they only touch the car right in front of them. You know, Donna Adelson never calls Catherine McBanois or Sigfredo Garcia. Charlie Adelson never calls Sigfredo Garcia or vice versa. Oh, okay, it was at another dental office. Okay, I think that's why I thought it was at their dental office, because I heard that she was also working the dental office as well. I might have just assumed it was at the Ad Adelson's dental place. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yikes, man. There's a lot of red flags here. A lot of red flags. So if this is a murder for hire, as law enforcement suspects, could it be that the defendant was wisely insulating himself from the actual shooters by having Catherine Magbanwa act as a middleman between see, them? You see hit that act right there where he's like, oh, God, I'm shaking my head. I can't believe this. Look at this. Look at this guy over here. What an actor from the actual shooters what by having actor. Catherine McBanois act as a middleman between them. Law enforcement decided to launch an undercover investigation uh, designed to clarify who the members of the conspiracy were and how information traveled within this conspiracy. 
So police applied for and received court authorization to listen in real time to the phone calls of the defendant and Catherine McManwa. And this is what's known as a wiretap. By this point, the, the point that the uh, law enforcement received authorization to do this wiretap, it was April of 2016. So it's been not quite, but almost two years since the murder of Dan Markell, which occurred in July of 2014. So by I actually didn't know that wiretaps were still a thing. I thought wiretaps were like only like with like home phones and stuff like that. But were they wiretapping these people's like cell phones? Be kind of interesting to look into the technology of wiretapping. Not going to lie, I don't feel bad for Catherine, but it's a bit of a shame how much she was in love with this guy. I wonder if she was in love or if she did it for money. Maybe both, right? Mm, mm, mm. By April of 2016, the defendant and Catherine McBanois are no longer dating at that point. They've been broken up since the fall of 2014. Catherine McBanois is actually back together with Sigfredo Garcia, the father of her children at that point. Um, the defendant has moved on to many other girlfriends since Catherine now. McBanois. But the defendant and Catherine McBanois are still in regular communication and have remained very close friends since the murder. And Rivera, who was the second hitman in that Prius, he, in April of 2016, was actually in federal prison doing time on, a, on another charge unrelated to this murder. So oh, no. Did the second hitman decide to talk because he wanted to reduce his charges for another unrelated case? I'm sorry. I, 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 OK, let me shut up. So all of the members of this conspiracy have presumably gone on with their lives, believing they've gotten away with this murder. So even though law enforcement has authority to listen to their calls now, you know, what, are they gonna, what reason would these people have to still be discussing the murder at this point? Mm. So police needed to stage an event that would generate conversation between the conspirators about the murder. And the oh. plan was to send an undercover agent posing as somebody on behalf of Luis Rivera, who was incarcerated, to walk up to Donna Adelson on the street yep. and try to extort money out of her. And okay. The crazy thing, too, was um, I listened to some of the conversations between this undercover agent and Donna Adelson, the grandmother, and the dude sounds like a cop. Like, the way that he talks, he sounds like a cop. I'm like, why did they choose this guy as an undercover agent? He sounds and talks like a cop. <laughs> he flipped to mitigate the sentence and is, oh, my God. Dude, is that what really happened? Lewis was locked up on other charges that later on would face life in prison for murder. Oh, my goodness. Okay, sorry. Law enforcement refers to this uh, as the bump. So this undercover agent walks up to Donna Adelson one day. She's leaving the Adelson Institute during the day. The undercover agent hands Donna Adelson a piece of paper. And on the piece of paper is an article about the murder of Dan Markell with his picture on it and, you know, FSU professor killed. Um, also on the piece of paper are a phone number and the amount of $5,000. The undercover agent tells Donna Adelson that he knows that the Adelsons are taking care of Katie and he's there to extort money out of her on Rivera's behalf oh. in order to even things out. The undercover agent never says the defendant's name or anything about the defendant's involvement to Donna oh. Adelson. She calls the son. Then law enforcement listens to see what will happen next. Will Donna Adelson go straight to the police to report this extortion attempt or will something else entirely happen? As suspected, based on the previously observed communication pattern, the first person that Donna Adelson calls after the bump is the defendant. Mm. Despite not Wendy, not the woman who lost her husband, but her son. Oh my goodness. Charlie was more worried about the IRS um, than Latin Kings extorting him. Oh, is there stuff going on with the IRS too, with their dental practice and stuff like that? Now, to physically uh, bug a phone, you have to put your hands on it. That's, I don't know. That's, oh, wiretapping can be done on cell phones because it's over the tower. Gotcha. Okay. That's what I'm probably mixing between the two. Bugging and like wiretapping. I thought bugging and wiretapping were used um, synonymously. <laughs> he was doing 13 years for uh, robbery, received 19 for murder to run concurrently, serving six years for this. Six? 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 Donna Adelson calls after the bump is the defendant. Despite the fact that the undercover agent never mentioned the defendant to her. Mm. On that first call, one would think that Donna Adelson would say to her son, you know, it's so crazy. Some man came up to me and he's handed me this article about yep. Danny's murder and he's, yep. he's, you know, seems like he's demanding money from us. Mm -hmm. She never says any of that. In fact, she never says Dan Markell's name at all. Instead, she tells the defendant that she needs to talk to him in person. In person, <laughs> not over the phone. About Smart. some paperwork that was hand delivered to her. She said that this paperwork, she says this to the defendant, TV. it involves the two of us. And 
that he should know what she's talking about. She says that he should bring cash to their meeting. And she also says that this TV is about five. Donna Adelson tells the defendant that the man who approached her mentioned an ex-girlfriend. Donna Adelson never says which ex-girlfriend she's referring to. She never says Catherine McBanois or Katie's name to the defendant in that phone call. She so apparently TV is a recurring term in this case. Um, they were saying that the word TV was used as a code um, that would have to do with the murder of Dan Markell. We get it in code. He only says that the blackmailer I don't mentioned. I thought of Amber when I said that out loud. <laughs> I was like, eh, maybe no one will figure that out. Hitmen usually have diarrhea of the mouth. Especially, you know, if they're people that are criminals and they're gonna they're gonna fuck up again in the future, you know, they might be like, oh, by the way, you know, I got something juicy for you if you reduce my sentence. Or Katie's name to the defendant in that phone call. She only says that the blackmailer mentioned an ex-girlfriend. The defendant never asked his mom Who's ex-girlfriend? My ex-girlfriend? Which ex-girlfriend? Mm. He never asked that. Because as the evidence will show, he didn't need to. He knew that this TV is about five. It meant that she was being blackmailed about Danny's murder for 5000 And he knew that the ex-girlfriend in question was Catherine McManua. And we know that because after this call with his mother, there's a defendant. The defendant calls Catherine McManua. <laughs> he doesn't call his most recent ex-girlfriend. He doesn't even call the most recent ex-girlfriend before the most recent ex-girlfriend, the one before that. No, he calls Catherine McBanois. And his call to Catherine McBanois is the only call that he makes to any ex-girlfriend after getting the information from his mother that the blackmailer mentioned an ex-girlfriend. Oh, and no. he had not dated Catherine McBanois for a year and a half at that point. And although the defendant threatens to do it often, <laughs> neither he nor his mom ever report the matter to the police. Mm -hmm. The only people that he discusses it with in these calls is Donna Adelson and Catherine McBanois. And you'll hear these phone calls between the conspirators. And as you listen to these calls, y'all will notice that they are being cautious about what they say in, over the phone. It's very apparent that they are very careful with their words because they are immediately suspicious that law enforcement could be listening to their conversations. I'm actually surprised that they're even having phone calls at all. And it's not just like, you know, send them, <laughs> send like a carrier over <laughs> What's on the little ravens, you know, on a scroll. <laughs> But yeah, I'm surprised that they're having these phone calls um, since they're already being so overly cautious is like you would think they would just like meet in person or something. Oh, boy. So Donna Adelson calls uh, the defendant and the defendant's first call is to Catherine Mbanwa. Mm -hmm. After that, the defendant then meets up with his mom in person like his mom requested. And his mom gives him this paperwork that the undercover agent gave her. Then next, the what defendant and Catherine Mbanwa meet up in person. And they meet up at a restaurant in Miami called Dolce Vita. And while they sat at their table in this, Dolce Vita is a busy, noisy restaurant, an undercover FBI agent sat at a table nearby with a hidden camera in their bag and recorded this conversation. And in the recording, we hear the defendant discussing whether the man who walked up to his mom could be an undercover police officer or someone who's trying to blackmail them. And if it's the latter, if it's a blackmailer, is it somebody who's just trying to make a quick buck or is it somebody who actually knows information from the inside. The defendant reassures Catherine McVanwell that if it is the police, that's a good thing. The defendant thinks that if it's the police, that means that they do not have enough evidence to charge anybody. In fact, the defendant <laughs> tells her, if they had any evidence, we would have already gone to the airport. Oh no, we've already gone to the airport. Guess who went to the airport yesterday? Donna and Harvey Adelson. He's scribbling F, F, I'm F, this is F, sucks. <laughs> The defendant starts giving her some legal advice. He says that, hey, in order to prove that someone committed a crime, you have to be able to put the person at the scene of the crime at the time it was committed, mm, which smart. unfortunately for them is not an accurate statement of the law. <laughs> it's important to note too, at the time of this conversation at Dolce Vita, no arrests had been made. The only thing that police had released to the public was a photo of the Prius that fled the scene. Mm. This, this was the Prius that Garcia and Rivera rented and used the day of Dan Martel's murder. So police knew at that point that it was Garcia and Rivera who were in the Prius, but the public did not know that yet and no arrests had been made because they wanted to do this undercover investigation. 
And so the fact that this photo of this Prius had been released to the public is interesting in light of some of the things that y'all will hear the defendant say to Catherine McVanwa in the Dolce Vita recording. He starts giving Catherine McVanwa several analogies, all involving rental cars used to commit crimes. He reassures her that hey, if DNA is found in a car, all that means is that at one point the person sat in the car. And if that car was later used in a crime, police can't prove that just from a person's DNA being in the car. The defendant points out to her that if a rental car is found that was at a crime scene, police also have to prove who was driving it at the time. He gives her a very relevant hypothetical of her renting a car in Miami oh God. and someone asking to borrow it and driving to Orlando to commit a robbery and how she would be innocent in that hypothetical mm. because she wasn't in the car at the time of the robbery. So through these analogies, the defendant is reassuring Catherine McVanwa that even if police identify who rented the car that fled the scene, they still would not have enough evidence to hold anybody responsible for the murder, even if they did find out it was Garcia and Rivera. The defendant also says that crimes are tough to prove unless someone actually witnessed the suspect commit a crime, or a suspect makes a confession, or a suspect is caught on a wire talking about the crime. So the defendant's trying to reassure her about the lack of evidence, and hey, as long as we all stay quiet, then we don't have anything to worry about. At one point, the defendant said, asked her, let me ask you a question. And then he asked her about money. He says, when everybody was there the next day, did you take any money? Like, are any of you driving around in a Bentley? Or, I mean, or no, it's not like any of you are driving around in a Bentley or cruising around in a mega yacht. So here the defendant's pointing out that the money wasn't used to buy anything flashy that would draw the attention of the police. <laughs> or so he thought. Um... Oh, wait, no, she was arrested in 2016. Okay, she was arrested in 20... Yeah, but still, 2016 to 20, 2022? What took so long for them to get to the Adelsons? This is a pretty good prosecutor. Yeah, we like prosecutor Sarah. Let's go, prosecutor Sarah. Pointing out that the money wasn't used to buy anything flashy that would draw the attention of the police. Yes, and when discussing... A job. And you all will hear during the course of this trial why, why his statement or his question about the money from the next day is particularly important. The evidence will show that Catherine Magbanwa went to the defendant's home the night of the murder where he paid her in cash. And the next day, Catherine McVanwa paid Garcia and Rivera their cuts of the money. How much? When discussing the possibility of whether th this is actually some gangster trying to blackmail his family for money, the defendant says that whoever this person is, whoever it is, knows information. The defendant told Catherine McVanwa that there are two ways of dealing with this guy. They could call the police, but then the guy blackmailing them would be charged with trying to blackmail his family. And the blackmailer would start talking and he would start calling out Catherine McVanwa's name. And then police are gonna be asking questions about what happened. The other option is to pay the blackmailer, but let him know that this is a one-time thing and try to, try to scare the blackmailer off by saying, hey, if you come around again, we're going to the police. So the defendant then gives Catherine McVanwa very precise instructions. He wants her to call the blackmailer and tell him that, you know, this, is, this would be what he wants Catherine McVanwa to say. My friends, meaning the Adelson family, have no idea what you're talking about. And I don't have any idea what you're talking about either. But the name of the person who you said is incarcerated sounds familiar. So I'm going to give you this money as charity to help the less fortunate. But charity. don't contact these people again or they're going to go to the police. Sure, you said charity. So Garcia and his alleged accomplice, uh, Luis Rivera, were charged in June 2016. Uh, Catherine was arrested months later in October 2016. Yeah, I know that she had two trials because the first one was the hung jury. Um, Garcia was convicted in 2019 of first degree murder, has appealed his conviction. Rivera pleaded guilty to second degree murder. I just wonder, um, it's just kind of interesting to me that like everything is happening in like slow stages, you know? It's like, okay, we're getting these two guys first and let's charge her. Let's wait for her trial to happen and then we'll go after Charlie. And now maybe we'll go after Donna. I guess like I'm just surprised to see the like um, it's like all happening like separately um, and not having like everyone just being bundled together. But I guess they were just doing it carefully, hoping that like at some point they would turn and they would be able to get like another person and then get another person and another person. Because I was also wondering how come like the family wasn't like all like charged either. They just didn't have enough evidence on like um, the mom, I guess, and maybe even Wendy. Katie was offered full immunity before her first and her second. She refused it, and now she got life in prison. The lead prosecutor is uh, Georgia Kaplan. She's a badass. Oh, she's not doing opening statements? Seems like a slam dunk. And the defendant said he would give Catherine McBannon the 5000 to pay off the blackmailer, except he's concerned, though, that this won't resolve the issue for good. The defendant is worried that this guy is not going to go away 
that he's gonna keep coming back for more and more money. And the defendant offers a solution to have this blackmailer killed. And he said- Wait, what did Trago say? Oh, retracted? Maybe you're gonna retype it. I was reading it and then it disappeared. <laughs> he's willing to pay whatever it takes. The defendant tells her that, this is the defendant talking to Catherine Banwa, this guy, meaning the blackmailer, is effing with him and his wife. And you'd better kill him or he's gonna be a big problem because he knows who you are. And the defendant then says, if he can't handle this, I'll have somebody else do it. The defendant- Cause my thing is like, weren't they worried that at some point Charlie, cause like Charlie, Wendy and like Donna, like couldn't they have just like left the US like a long time ago? Were they worried about that? Okay, so uh, Trago says that, you know, said it's almost as if they've already done this trial. So hopefully it will be quick, easy and smooth. Boom, convicted. Gotcha, gotcha. The defendant then says, if he can't handle this, I'll have somebody else do it. The defendant says, so help me God, if they fuck with my family, it's gonna be Nazi shit because this will be done. I mean, Katie, I don't care what I spend. It's important to note during this conversation and the entire wiretap, the defendant <laughs> never says Sigfredo Garcia's name. But the evidence will show that the defendant was talking about Sigfredo Garcia when the defendant says that the blackmailer was effing with him and his wife. And if, hey, if he can't do it, I'll find someone else who will. Because immediately after that, the defendant checks with Catherine McVanois to make sure that Garcia has no hard feelings towards him, no reason not to help him. He says, hey, I have you on salary. You think he'd be happy about that? And he also says, I mean, our paths never cross, meaning, hey, Garcia wasn't in the picture when he and Catherine McVanois were together, there wasn't any overlap. After hearing that the defendant wants someone killed and is willing to pay whatever it takes to get it done, Catherine McVanois then asks the defendant to help her out. And the defendant reassures her that she'll be taken care of by saying, he says, I don't have to, <laughs> sometimes the chairs can be a little wobbly. I know this has taken a bit, but I'm almost done. Thank y'all for being patient. All right, so she asked him to help her out and the defendant reassures her that she'll be taken care of. He says, he doesn't have to tell her the things that he'll do for her. He shows her what he'll do for her. She doesn't have to ask him for anything. He looks for things to do. He says, hey, when someone's birthday's coming up or there's car problems, she doesn't have to ask. He looks for ways to help. And after his meeting with Catherine Magnanwa, the defendant immediately calls Donna Abelson to let her know mm. that everything's fine. And he does mm. this using some pretty obvious code words, which y'all will hear, and you'll hear the conspirators often use words to mask the meaning of what they're actually talking about. Catherine Magbanois then also using these code words, tasks G Garcia with calling the number on the paperwork and finding out if a blackmailer is a legitimate associate of Rivera or not. And in the series of recorded calls that follow, you guys are gonna hear these conspirators talking and using words like TV, Hmm. False leads, listings, properties, clients, rap songs, CDs, pot belly pigs, relationship advice, <laughs> all these different terms that are normal <laughs> terms any of us may use, but Caught they're the used pigs. in context in these calls that if you're listening to the conversation, do not make any sense. For example, in the calls, the defendant and Catherine McMinnwa don't outright debate the pros and cons of whether they should pay this blackmailer. Instead, they talk about the fact that this property Ooh. is cheap. They might expect a property like this to even be a million dollars. This property seems like a great deal, but if you get the wrong tenant in there, the tenant may keep increasing the rent and that tenant may become a leech that never leaves you. So it will be up to y'all to decide whether this defendant is actually worried about a future tenant of a property that might raise the rent and pay him more money, or if the defendant is actually worried that if he pays off the blackmailer, then the blackmailer may continue to come back again and again, or send a cousin or a friend to become a leech that never leaves him, that he can't get rid of. Charlie is the criminal mastermind of the family. Charlie and Wendy have an older brother, Rob, who does, oh, is it the older brother? I did hear that there's also another um, Adelson's son who cut ties with the family. Um, apparently he married someone that the family didn't like and maybe there's some family drama, so he cut ties with them. Oof, so I wonder if, I wonder if the older brother, Rob, does he have children? Because maybe, Maybe Donna was like, you know, I don't have contact with, if Rob has kids, um, I don't have contact with, you know, my other grandkids. Charlie Adelson at that time, I don't think had kids. And now, you know, she has two grandchildren, her only two grandchildren, and she was not really able to see them. So I wonder if that really fueled her to want to push this even more so she can, you know, have the father of the kids disappear so the grandchildren could be close to her. Um, I think I, I think I did hear that Charlie Edison does have a five-year-old right now. Crazy that that five-year-old is losing their dad. Charlie's older brother, Rob, married a non-Jew, got shunned from the family. Yeah, that's, I think that's what I heard as well. In another of these calls, the defendant tells Catherine McVanwa that 
whoever this person is, this blackmailer is, he's got a lot of effing details. And in another, they discuss the fact that this blackmailer is not from the inside. And the defendant says that this guy is probably not from the first layer, but the second layer. So not someone who got info from Garcia, but maybe somebody who got info from Rivera. But one fact, and let me just say, as the jury, you all will interpret and decide what they're really talking about in these calls. Only y'all can determine the meaning and the weight to give this evidence, and only you can separate just mere coincidences from evidence in a conspiracy. But one fact, though, is really clear throughout these calls is that all of these conspirators are hopeful that this blackmailer is law enforcement just trying to get information, because they think if it's law enforcement and the police don't have enough to bring charges, just fishing for information versus the other possibility which would obviously be much worse for them, that the Adelsons are being blackmailed by somebody who actually knows inside information about their roles in Dan Martell's murder and may tell the police what they know. Charlie's baby mama has a uh, Winnie's nanny. Can make this crap up. Charlie's baby, are, are they not together anymore? Do they also have issues as well? They waited because they, um, if they fled, it would immediately show guilt because if they didn't flee and the police were suspicious, they kept tabs. I mean, when people are starting to go down for this, you know, I figured they would probably have left the country by now. But, you know, I'm glad that they stuck around. I'm glad. You know, they tried to go to Vietnam yesterday. Didn't work out. Mm -mm. So after this undercover operation, which was in 2016, Luis Rivera, Alfredo Garcia, and Catherine McVanua uh, are, are arrested. They're charged with the same charges before y'all in this trial. And Luis Rivera ended up cutting a deal with the state to tell law enforcement the truth about the murder of Dan Markell Damn. and the people responsible. Rivera told law enforcement that he was hired by Sigfredo Garcia to help kill Dan Markell. And Rivera described how Garcia told him that Catherine McVanua, the mother of Garcia's children, secured this job for them. And the job was in Tallahassee and it paid $100,000, with Rivera's being cut being about a third of it, 35. That's all they got? Seriously? They did this for like $30,000? $30,000? Seriously? I thought they were getting like half a million each or something. Sometimes when I hear about this like hitman for hire shit and then I realize how much the hitman was paid, it's just crazy. It's like you're willing to kill someone and get in trouble for this amount of money. Like, I don't know. Maybe unless you have a backstory where it's like, oh, I need money because my two year old has cancer and she needs money for the treatment. Da, 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 da. Like, you know, there's like some sobby backstory like that. But if it's just like, oh, I just want 30K, like, damn, 30K, like, let's do it for 30K, kill someone for 30K. That's, that's just wild thousand dollars and Rivera explained that he and Garcia actually made two trips to Tallahassee with the intent of killing Dan Markell the first one was yeah, a month before the murder it was in June of 2014 and the second was when Dan Markell was actually killed in July of 2014 Rivera said that he bought a gun off the street for that second trip and Garcia rented a car I'm sorry for the June trip uh Rivera bought a gun off the street and Garcia rented the car for that trip the boob job and the motorbike they did she mentioned it earlier Lily <laughs> It was like, after they got this money, what did they do with this money? Oh, they got some motorbikes, you know. Katie got a new car. She got a boob job. It's like, you did all that for boob jobs and cars and motorbikes? Like, really, guys? Like, really? You know? Garcia and Rivera did some scouting on that trip of Dan Markell's residence, some surveillance, but ultimately couldn't get the job done. They ended up heading, heading back to Miami. Um, during the trip to Tallahassee, he said that Garcia had a piece of paper with a picture of the man that they were supposed to kill on it. Oh, my and God. And some handwritten notes as well. Oh, my Cell God. Cell phone records corroborated Rivera's information about the June trip. <laughs> Rivera also told a story about an incident in Tallahassee where he and Garcia were riding down the road in the rented Prius, and Garcia accidentally discharged the murder weapon, and the bullet struck the floorboard of the Prius. Law enforcement tracked down that actual Prius Wait, again really? and were able to see evidence in the undercarriage that corroborated Rivera's information about the accidental discharge. <laughs> oh my God. So they're looking at the phone evidence, they're trying to find whatever they can to kind of um, corroborate what he's telling them. I mentioned earlier that both men, Garcia and Rivera, cut their phones off from the time that they left Premier and kept them off until well after the murder when they're on their way back home. Rivera said that the first call that either of them made after the homicide was from Garcia to Magbanwa, where Garcia told her that the job was done and Magbanwa assured them <clears throat> that they would get their money the next day, which they did, Rivera says, when Catherine Magbanwa brought cash to him at his home. And all this information that Luis Rivera provided them was corroborated by, including when the money was dropped off, was corroborated by cell phone records in this case. Luis Rivera told police that the next day after the murder, he was paid in cash 
by Catherine Mabanawa, and that the money was packaged in a very unusual way. Oh, the money God. was in stacks of $100 bills, and the money was stapled together. Yeah. The stacks of 100s, every $1,000 was stapled together. During this trial, y'all will hear that the defendant had access to a lot of cash, and nothing's wrong with that. He had a lot of cash because his family gives cash discounts at their dental practice, and he keeps the cash that he receives in a safe. Again, nothing wrong about that either. However, what is relevant in this case is that the defendant had a very unusual practice of keeping the cash in his safe in $1,000 stacks of $100 bills oh. that were stapled together. <laughs> Oh my God, they speaking in code words. They're like, come on now, like seriously? Oh no, oh, they're so silly, stapled, like, oh my goodness. Charlie Adelson, why are you sitting there so smug, writing your little notes, trying to be busy? You're like, this is wild to me, man. The jury's probably like, <laughs> Oh my goodness. The Marcos can still sell the Adelsons for all their money for wrongful death. Oh, sue the Adelsons. Oh man. I, I hope, I hope so. I hope so. This is just wild. This is so crazy. I also had something else I wanted to say, but I just forgot. I'm sorry. There's just so many, too many things going on in my mind right now, but yeah, the Mark Cowles, they should definitely go after the Adelsons. Oh man. And then the kids are still under the care of, of Wendy. I feel so bad for the grandparents. I really do. I feel, I feel bad for Dan Markell's family. Together, just like the money Luis Rivera received. Over the last few years, since the 2016 arrest and interview of Luis Rivera, Rivera, law enforcement has not stopped working on this case. There were trials in 2019 and 2022, so right before the pandemic and right after the pandemic, of co-conspirators. Law enforcement also continued to try to gather all the evidence that they possibly could. They continued to interview people who may possibly have any information about the case. They tried to clarify any audio recordings that couldn't be clearly heard. While the phone wiretaps are very clear, the wiretap conversations that took place in public places when these people were meeting in person were not clearly audible back in 2016. Some still aren't, but because these public places are often too noisy. For instance, the recording of the conversation between the defendant and Catherine McManua and Dolce Vita had too much background noise to be able to clearly hear what the conspirators were talking about. However, since 2016, as technology developed over oh, the years, no. and um, thanks to law enforcement's just continued dedication, law enforcement the eventually audio. found an expert that was formerly employed by the CIA with improved technology and enough expertise to clarify this recording at Dolce Vita that y'all will hear. And he did that by being able to reduce as much background noise as possible. And once this recording was clarified, which was actually just early last year, in 2022, the state arrested this defendant. Uh, Wendy and Charlie barely glance at each other when she testified. And you know what's wild? You know who's not in the courtroom right now sitting there in their son's murder trial? Um, apparently, Donna Adelson and Harvey Adelson never showed up, was never there to support their kid. I wonder if they were like watching the live streams was like, OK, Harvey, Donna, let's watch the live stream. And when things get a little bit dicey. Go to fucking Vietnam. Let's go to Vietnam. Like, I don't know. I wonder if they're just like at home watching the live streams. W for technology. Yes, all the way. Um, I haven't heard this recording yet, though. I, I can't wait to hear the recording. The presentation of this evidence, as y'all can see from opening, it's a lot. It's a lot of information. It's going to take a little bit of time. It is. And it may be tedious at times. And I want to thank y'all in advance for the careful attention uh, to all of the evidence y'all see in here during this trial. When you'll do, you'll see that this defendant carried out his plan to hire a hitman to kill Dan Markell. He conspired and he solicited Catherine Magbanoa to get this murder done. And he paid her for the job once it was completed. This defendant acted in furtherance of this murder plot that went Charlie beyond just thinking about it or talking about head. it. And these acts make him guilty as a principal to first degree murder just as if he pulled the trigger himself. Yeah, see, where Donna at? Where Harvey at? Where, 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 the, where the sister at? How come no one's there supporting him? While the Harvey defendant's prison? choices helped solve a problem within his family, they came at a very high price. He took the life of a loving father of two little boys, and he caused a lifetime of grief for Dan Martell's loved ones. Mm -hmm. Y'all heard a lot in jury selection about how important this trial is to the defendant, which I'm sure it is. But Dan Martell was loved. He was a brother, he was a son. And this trial is his family's opportunity to see justice done for the person who set up their son's murder. And at the conclusion of this evidence, y'all will be convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that this defendant is guilty. And at that point, we'll ask you for the only verdict that does justice in this case, which is a verdict that the defendant is guilty as charged.
Thank y'all. Oof, that is, that is, this case is wild, man. This is crazy. Again, remember, Dan Markell was murdered in 2014. We're in 2023 right now. Like, that's so wild. Um, seems like the Adelson Empire falling apart. Oh, man. Um, again, Donna Adelson, 70-something-year-old grandmother, uh, was arrested yesterday. Her and her husband, Harvey, were on their way to Vietnam. And you know what? They bought a one-way ticket, which is kind of weird to me because this family seems like they got money. I don't know why you would buy a one-way ticket. But anyways, um, bought a one-way ticket. And it seems like the investigators were already kind of like tailing her. Um, but they wanted to move quickly because, you know, if they're going to be in Vietnam and they're not going to come back to the United States, it'll be hard to extradite them back from Vietnam to the United States of America. So they decided to move quickly and just fucking arrest her at the spot. But we'll see what happens. Donna's 73 years old. 73 years old. I'm surprised that she didn't decide to take the fall for her son. Be like, you know what? I did it. I'm the mastermind. It was me. My son had nothing to do with it or something like that. Because, like, you know, you're in your 70s and, you know, like, you going to jail. Like, you lived a good, long life, right? I don't know. I'm surprised she didn't want to take the fall for her son. But, uh, guys, I do have to go. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Uh, today, we talked about the Adelson family. Hiring a hitman to murder Dan Markell. It is wild because, again, um, Donna Adelson has been arrested, but there's still Wendy Adelson as well, the wife or sorry, ex-wife of Dan Markell. And, um, yeah, we don't know too much information about the father, but sorry, not the father, but, but about Harvey, Wendy's father. But, um, guys, I do have a video that's pending right now. Uh, we have a video that I'm like super interested in, and I think you guys might be interested in it as well. I'm working on editing it right now. Hopefully, I'll, it'll be ready by, by the end of this week. And then uh, we'll definitely keep an eye on the Adelson stuff. I do want to watch the cross-examination um, of Charlie Adelson because he does testify. Um, he's going to go up there and explain that like, no, no, guys, I'm the victim in all of this. I'm the victim just like Dan Markell. These people, these savages, they try to blackmail me, you know? They try to take my money and da 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 da, -da. So he's going to go up there and he's going to weep and stuff like that. Um, and then also, Wendy Adelson does go up there and, you know, testifies as well. And we do want to listen to that. We want to listen to that, the cross-examination. So, um, and then closing arguments. So yeah, we'll definitely get to closing arguments. And yeah, I hope you guys will be there to join me. Uh, we'll do it on the live stream, on Twitch, and on YouTube as well. But Guys, thank you so much for hanging out. I appreciate your guys' support. Thank you so much for those who are subscribed um, on YouTube. And then the memberships are, it's like different vernacular. It's like subscription on, on Twitch. And then it's like membership on YouTube. But they're like the same thing. <laughs> but I appreciate your guys' support. Um, thank you so much earlier for the super chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But thanks for being here. Most importantly, thanks for chatting. And then thanks for having me in the background. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Um... And then, yeah, if you guys enjoyed the stream, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already. And I, th I think that's about it. <laughs> All right, guys, I hope you guys have a good one. And I'll see you guys later on this week. All right. Uh, bye. Take care and, uh, you know, drink lots of water, wear some sunblock and take care of yourselves. Okay. Bye.